this is a definitely a male. Thank <laughs> 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 This is, it's also my magazine, but. <laughs> it goes under my shirt because men go the other way, you know, and it, it comes on the outside. So for women, I will put it on the, on this one. Something. Okay. Yeah, I already introduced myself. Okay. So, um, welcome back, and um, I will try to uh, walk you through a review of teleconnections on uh, intra-seasonal time scale. And this is actually um, the topic of a recent uh, review paper that we just um, published in uh, Review of Geophysics. But uh, before I uh, begin my presentation, I would like to explain uh, the many of the acronyms that uh, you see on, on my uh, title slide. Um, there is no need to uh, explain the ICPP uh, acronym, our host and uh, main sponsor of this uh, activity. Here on uh, the left, these two uh, acronyms represent two uh, major uh, programs of WMO, the WWRP, which is focused on weather, and WCRP with a focus on um, climate. The, uh, the third acronym here um, uh, represents the uh, subseasonal to seasonal prediction project, which is a, um, a project uh, sponsored by the by uh, WRP and WCRP. Uh, designed to um, bridge the gap between the weather and climate. And finally, this uh, acronym here, uh, YTMIT, stands for the Year of Tropics, Mid-Latitude Interactions and Teleconnection, and this is an international project fostered by the uh, subseasonal to seasonal uh, project. Um, and uh, it started this summer and will go on until um, summer of um, 2019. And the main objectives of this um, uh, project um, is to um, try to answer some of the uh, still uh, remaining questions um, regarding the um, um, teleconnections on intra-seasonal time scales. So the uh, outline of my presentation uh, includes a description of the influence of the tropics on the mid-latitudes. And I will uh, present this uh, from an observational uh, perspective, um, divided between the northern and southern hemisphere. And then I will look at some modeling studies in the uh, northern and southern hemisphere. And the modeling studies I'm talking here are those related to try to understand the mechanisms explaining the, uh, these teleconnections, something uh, along the lines that um, David talked about. Uh, I will talk next about the influence of the mid-latitudes uh, on the tropics, and then uh, the two-way uh, interactions and, and feedbacks. Um, then I will uh, review um, some of the work that has been done um, to uh, forecast the teleconnections on intra-seasonal time scales. And finally, I will try to summarize um, some of the um, remaining challenging, uh, challenges, um, hopefully uh, provide you with some uh, fruit for, uh, for thoughts uh, for your future um, research. So uh, the idea of uh, uh, relationship between the tropics and extratropics dates back to uh, 1950 and can actually be uh, attributed to Herbert Riel, who um, was analyzing um, the so-called, he called the topography of the uh, 300 millibar um, surface on a particular day, was August 26, 1945. And um, this, is actually, this is not uh, 
climatology is a real-time uh, map. And uh, he noticed that the most outstanding features on this map are the uh, breakdown of tropical um, atmosphere into a train of vortices and the complete interlocking of flow between the uh, tropics and the um, high uh, latitudes. Riel hypothesized that uh, heat is injected into the polar zones in a few narrow um, strips of longitude that he marked with this uh, line, uh, lines here. And uh, he thought that at least uh, in part, changes of the flow configurations and intensity in, uh, in high, uh, high latitudes must be uh, dependent on the availability of uh, uh, disturbances in the tropics to um, extend, um, to um, create this, uh, this uh, troughs. And uh, Riel uh, hypothesized that the, so the, energy, the source energy uh, of these disturbances comes from the um, latent heat um, associated with, uh, with convection. Of course, at that time, um, people were not talking about uh, teleconnections. Um, this is something that we, uh, we later uh, try to attribute. Um, about uh, 15 uh, years later, Birkness was uh, comparing the distribution of the uh, mid-latitude circulations for uh, uh, various um, SST anomalies in the eastern equatorial Pacific going from um, 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 not so warm anomalies to uh, warm SST anomalies. And uh, uh, he noticed that the, um, the strongest uh, circulation uh, tends to be uh, that develops um, in the northern uh, in the zonal winds of northern hemisphere winters tends to be associated with uh, the warmer uh, SSD. Um, and um, one interesting aspect, um, uh, an interesting uh, hypothesis that uh, Birkness advanced at that time was that uh, this uh, will have implication for the future uh, seasonal forecasting of what he called the climatic anomalies over uh, North America and uh, over Europe. So um, a long time ago, people started to think about the uh, potential of doing um, seasonal forecasting. So for more than uh, uh, 20 uh, years, this subject was um, set aside and um, re-emerged in, uh, in the early uh, 80s when um, um, people um, started to talk about um, this uh, re uh, relationship between the tropics and the extra tropics. And I would like to point out that it took more than a decade after the discovery of the MJO um, that people started to um, try to make connections between the uh, MJO or convective activity in the tropics and uh, the circulation in the mid latitudes. And, Probably the main impediment was the lack of uh, observations with um, global coverage. So based on uh, a relatively short um, record, these pioneers' uh, work showed that the uh, mid-latitude circulation can be affected by the tropical convection during the periods when um, convective activity um, is moving from the uh, Indian Ocean uh, into the Western Pacific. And um, they demonstrated that when the um, convection is located uh, in this uh, region, uh, the associated circulation consists of this uh, pair of uh, downwind cyclones located near the uh, region with um, suppressed uh, convection. These um, cyclones, uh, extend over the whole uh, Pacific region and their meridional structure allow them to uh, extend into the mid latitudes uh, on both hemispheres, like uh, we see here, and near the um, 35 40 uh, north. One 
um, particular uh, paper that uh, probably you were expecting to see uh, listed on the previous slide is this one by Liebman and Hartmann. And uh, I, I wanted to uh, mention it um, separately because um, they, they also uh, found the relationship between the um, circulation in the mid-latitudes mid and the tropical uh, convection. But um, they, um, they claim that uh, this uh, relationship can, um, this exchange can take place only in, uh, in the exit region of the um, uh, south of the uh, uh, Asian, uh, uh, South Asian jet. And uh, they, um, in this schematic, they show that the uh, convective activity um, located here at the uh, jet entrance region uh, will induce this um, um, meridional um, circulation, in, will create this uh, meridional circulation, which will be induced by the ageostrophic winds uh, um, that exist in the uh, jet uh, entrance region. And they found no relationship between the uh, regions uh, of uh, um, tropical convection and the anomalies over uh, North America and the uh, Atlantic region. So this, is, this was um, a slightly different conclusion than the previous studies. And uh, one of the main questions that um, 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 drove the, the future research, and it's still an open question today, is what are the geographical regions where the tropical forcing is most effective in exciting um, the uh, extratropical circulation um, anomalies. So uh, once the um, reanalysis um, became available, people started to uh, look at the uh, variability of the climate uh, patterns in the mid-latitudes, such as the NAO and PNA, and try to link this uh, uh, teleconnection pattern to the uh, activity in, in the tropics. Uh, around that time, it was found that in the northern hemisphere, there are two modes of uh, variability with the periods of about 48 and uh, 23 uh, days. And also the uh, North Pacific circulation anomalies develop one, two weeks after the uh, appearance of the um, convection uh, anomalies in uh, over the tropical Pacific. Um, so um, later on, when the um, more data became um, available, um, people started to think of the MJO as a forcing of the mid-latitude teleconnection. And it was found that uh, some studies were suggesting a phase locking between the PNA uh, and the, and, uh, the um, MJO, uh, with uh, the MJO explaining about 30% of the PNA variability. Whereas other studies, um, like uh, uh, this one by Riddell et al., published in 2013, were suggesting that MJO uh, may only uh, excite a PNA-like pattern, but not a pure uh, PNA pattern. So here, uh, in this figure taken from um, uh, the paper by uh, Riddell et al., we are looking at the um, probability, the frequency of occurrence of regimes in which uh, the PNA events take place. And um, we are looking at the, um, each panel corresponds to an MJO phase, which um, for those of you who are not familiar what the MJO phase is, we will, uh, you will hear something um, later on. And then the left panel corresponds to the positive phase of the PNA, and the right panel corresponds to the negative uh, phase of the PNA. So um, these um, red colors here uh, indicates the uh, high uh, frequency of occurrence of the PNA uh, pattern, whereas the, uh, the blue lines indicate the low um, 
probability of the uh, PNA uh, patterns to, um, um, to take place. So when we look at the um, distribution or the, the frequency of the uh, positive phase and the frequency of the negative phase, we, don't, we see that we see an uh, asymmetry um, and uh, we also see that the MJO uh, doesn't have uh, such a large impact on the negative phase of, uh, of the PNA. So that's the reason that um, they reached the conclusion that uh, this is not a pure uh, PNA pattern, but it's a pattern that looks like, um, like the PNA. So there are uh, other studies, so that uh, um, looking at the uh, influence of the uh, MJO onto the um, North Atlantic region. Um, and it was found that the NAO is influenced by uh, tropical convection when uh, uh, MJO is in either phase two, four, which means the convection is located over the Indian Ocean or phase um, six, eight. Um, it was also found that the activity of the North Pacific uh, storm track during the winter is modulated by the tropical convection associated with the MJO. The winter surface air temperature uh, over North America uh, is characterized by a 70-day um, uh, oscillation, which is forced by uh, the MJO. And also, it was found that the MJO phase speed affects the mean latitude teleconnection uh, patterns. So, um, so far, uh, these results that uh, I mentioned were mostly focused on the uh, boreal winter, but uh, we do have a very small number of studies looking at the influence of the uh, boreal summer convective activity on the mean latitude teleconnection. And uh, Moon et al. Um, looked at the influence of the active phase of the South Asian monsoon and North American um, summer monsoon on the extratropical circulation, uh, in particular the surface uh, temperature anomalies. And um, they, do um, they did find significant um, teleconnections. And these uh, teleconnections show both uh, quasi-stationary um, characteristic and also eastward uh, propagating characteristics. Um, also, um, these uh, studies and these results that I mentioned so far, as you probably noticed, are focused on the northern hemisphere. But what about the southern hemisphere? Because when I uh, presented that uh, understanding of the, the teleconnections, uh, we said that teleconnections um, take place in, in both hemispheres. Well, um, for the southern hemisphere, um, we have a very limited number of studies, and um, the um, result seems to be slightly different from, from the northern hemisphere. So initially, a lot of studies were um, suggesting that there is no significant correlation between the um, tropical convective activity and the uh, large-scale circulation over the southern hemisphere. It was until um, 1993 when Burberry and Hegel found, found that the impact of the tropical heating on the mid-latitudes has a seasonal dependence. So here, um, this plot shows the uh, composites of the uh, 200 hectopascal velocity potential for days when the, um, with large OLR convective anomalies located at uh, 127 uh, east, um, around here, during the um, southern hemisphere summer. So in these composites, we see these um, circulation anomalies that uh, extend um, forward um, like a, a Rossby wave um, train. Whereas during the winter, um, the same composite, uh, while they show these anomalies, um, uh, the circulation uh, anomalies, they do not show these 
um, polar propagation, the Rossby wave train uh, that we see during the um, southern hemisphere summer. So um, moving on in time, um, observations uh, with higher uh, um, temporal frequency became available and uh, the uh, research started to be focused on the um, relationship between the tropical convection and the mid-latitude um, weather and in particular uh, extreme weather um, events. So here in a, uh, I have two examples. Uh, one um, showing that the uh, winter extreme precipitation over the uh, U.S. Uh, West Coast uh, is um, increased uh, after, uh, after uh, the MJO is in phase two. And this figure here, taken from a paper by Jones, um, shows um, the percentage of occurrence of extreme events um, during the active MJO phases, which um, is this black line and um, non-active um, MJO uh, events. The boxes that um, are listed here on the horizontal axis corresponds to various regions that um, they used to analyze. So it's very obvious from this uh, plot that the frequency of events associated with uh, active MJO events um, during phase two um, it's much larger than the frequency of events that uh, take place uh, when the uh, MJO is not active or is not in phase um, two. Another example um, is related to uh, the other side of the uh, Pacific. And uh, uh, Jiang um, in 2005 looked at the extreme cold surges in the surface air temperature over East Asia. And um, he plotted here the distribution of these um, ex the ex extreme events, and they are um, represented by these uh, larger uh, blue dots. And um, the other, and this diagram shows the phases of the MJO. You, we will learn more about this diagram um, later, and you will actually get to, um, to use this diagram in some of your um, lab uh, sessions. So when we look at the distribution of these cold events, we see that uh, they tend to be uh, favored by the uh, MJO convective activity um, located over the, um, the Indian Ocean. Another type of uh, extreme events, it's the so-called atmospheric rivers, and they are called extreme events because um, they are associated with uh, intense uh, streams of uh, precipitable uh, water, and they can cause heavy rains that are usually uh, so resulting uh, in flooding. So a number of studies found a coherent relationship between the MJO, the associated Rossby waves, and the atmospheric rivers, um, especially uh, the atmospheric rivers that um, takes place uh, on the west coast of United States. And uh, they have also found that the MJO um, in phase um, six, which means that the convection is located over the Western Pacific, tend to favor uh, these atmospheric river uh, activities. And not only that, the MJO tends to modulate the uh, atmospheric river activity in various regions over the world, like in Korea, Japan, Alaska, Europe, in Southern Hemisphere. And here, um, I'm just showing you as an example of um, large uh, influence of the M MJO onto the uh, atmospheric rivers. Um, I'm showing the, uh, the frequency difference, uh, which um, for the atmospheric rivers, <laughs> Um, that affect Hawaii um, as function of, of the uh, MJO phases. So again, we see that there are some uh, phases of the MJO in which the uh, frequency of occurrence um, is negative, which means that uh, 
this particular phase of the MJO doesn't uh, favor the um, development of atmospheric rivers, but there are phases of the MJO um, which favor, uh, which leads to the uh, increase of the um, frequency of atmospheric rivers. So these are uh, these examples that uh, I show here, and these results were based on uh, observations. So um, the conclusion is that observations provide enough evidence that support a statistical significant um, relationship between the um, tropics and, and mid latitudes. But um, as you um, probably noticed, I haven't said anything about the mechanism, uh, mechanisms driving this um, teleconnection. So um, all the results were based on statistical analysis, just um, looking at uh, our observations. So now I want to show you some um, results uh, from, um, I, I call modeling studies because uh, they are based on, uh, on models, um, but mostly um, theoret uh, theoretical models that uh, of various complexity, starting with very simple um, barotropic and baroclinic models like the one that uh, David described, um, that were designed, studies were, these studies were designed to try to understand uh, the mechanisms um, driving the um, teleconnection. So um, again, some of the early, in early days, uh, when uh, only um, very simple linear models were um, available, um, people have used these uh, models trying to uh, understand the uh, relationship between the um, tropical heating and the distribution of the mid-latitude circulation. And here is uh, an example uh, taken from a paper by Hoskins and Crowley, where they, uh, in, a, in this um, um, linear uh, baroclinic model, a two-layer model, they put a um, source of, uh, of heat in the tropical region and then they uh, analyze the um, response of the mid-latitude circulation by looking at this uh, 300 hectopascal um, geopotential high. So um, in this uh, um, map, we see that the um, response of the um, mid-latitude circulation to this uh, tropical heating um, are these um, wave train, uh, these Rossby waves that uh, propagate uh, poleward and uh, eastward and in, uh, in the upper um, troposphere. So there were also uh, other studies that, uh, and uh, in particular David mentioned, um, this study by um, Simons and all. And they also, uh, using uh, a similar um, simple model, they, uh, they were able to show that uh, propagation, perturbation, mid-latitude perturbation over the uh, Northeast Pacific are excited by uh, tropical forcing located over Southeast Asia and tropical Western Pacific. And also the Atlantic perturbations, uh, mid-latitude perturba perturbations in the uh, mid-latitude circulation uh, are forced by the uh, tropical uh, convective activity located to the um, southwest of, of this region, mostly uh, Indian Ocean and uh, uh, Western Pacific. So as uh, David described, uh, the, uh, the mechanism uh, driving this um, teleconnection was the, uh, the Rossby wave um, train. But a paper by uh, Sardesh Muk and, and Hoskins, which also David referred to, um, in this paper, they promoted the, uh, a different school of thought and uh, according to which the mid-latitude perturbation are associated 
with the fast growing mode of baroclinic, uh, uh, barotopic instability of the mid latitudes, um, which are uh, these uh, barotropic <laughs> instabilities are forced by by the Ro by uh, Rossby wave um, uh, trains, and by advancing this uh, hypothesis, they were trying to um, justify that uh, why um, the the response uh, of the mid latitudes doesn't. Um, um, it's not is in independent if um, if you have the source of your heating um, south of the equator or or north uh, of the equator. So, uh, like um, David said, another important result at that time was that the atmospheric uh, anomalies in the extratropic have a, um, a barotropic structure, um, and they also found that. Uh, this variability of the mid-latitude large-scale flow uh, is dominated by an oscillation with a period between uh, 28 and um, 72 um, days. Um, so one question that um, uh, was um, posed at that time, and it's still something that we don't um, completely understand, is how and why do the baroclinic uh, atmospheric anomalies in the tropics transition to barotropic anomalies by the time um, they reach the, uh, the extratropics, right? Because the, um, like David showed us uh, in his uh, pictures, when we look at the distribution of the um, disturbances in the tropics, they have this um, baroclinic structure, whereas the um, disturbances in the mid latitudes they have a barotropic um, structure. So, um, moving on in time, um, people realize that all of these uh, experiments that were done with this simple model used a very idealized uh, sources of tropical heating and in the real atmosphere, the uh, distribution is slightly more uh, complex or more complex than, than uh, uh, these idealized um, sources. So Ferranti et al. Um, designed an experiment still using a simple barotropic model in which they derive the structure of the uh, tropical heating uh, from the uh, observations. They just, took the first um, two EOFs of the um, distribution of the OLR anomaly uh, in the tropics, and they imposed um, this forcing uh, into a barotropic model. And surprisingly, using this very simple model, they were able to reproduce uh, with high fidelity uh, most of the features of the uh, 500 millibar uh, pattern um, that um, corresponds to, um, to the observations. Right. So the, um, the main conclusion here was that the, the um, characteristics of the tropical heating really have a large uh, impact on the um, circulation anomalies that uh, develop in, in the mid-latitudes. Uh, regardless of the uh, complexity of, of the model. So uh, next, uh, we um, started to enter into the so-called uh, GCMs uh, era when uh, models be uh, became uh, more complex. And um, Schubert and Park first um, tried to uh, look at the global uh, initialite uh, analysis of uh, produced by the uh, uh, ECM WF model, and they found that the or they show that the PNA appears to have uh, its main source of uh, energy in the mid latitudes, and the link to the tropics ma manifest as a phase locking with uh, anomalies forced by the um, by the tropical convection. So this is. Uh, a result 
a confirmation of the uh, result uh, obtained uh, earlier by other studies just um, looking at uh, the observations. Um, since the, uh, the, the earlier experiments in which uh, source of heating was specified were done with very simple models like the, um, linear barotropic and uh, baroclinic models, uh, once the GCMs became available, uh, people um, started to um, repeat these experiments with the uh, uh, GCMs that uh, are more <coughs> complex. And uh, um, they found that the propagation of the ROSP wave is sensitive to the uh, zonally varying uh, basic state. So this is a, uh, it was a new result <laughs> because the, um, the basic state in the, the previous models were just a linearized model about the basic state. So um, this was not possible to, um, to be uh, explored. And uh, they also found that the preferred uh, path for the Rossby wave train propagation uh, is in the regions with uh, prevailing uh, westerlies. Uh, they also uh, found that the response of the northern hemisphere to tropical heating is much stronger um, than in, in the southern hemisphere. And um, the uh, Rossby wave response to a fixed tropical heating um, establishes in 10, 15 days. And this result, it is actually consistent with uh, what uh, the previous um, results um, based on, on the observations. An interesting uh, result uh, was obtained by uh, Hailin, who's here, in 2007, when they use a, 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 dry, a, a primitive equation dry atmospheric model. And they show that this model can simulate uh, uh, tropical intraseasonal variability with the structure of, of the Kelvin wave and the divergent flow uh, associated uh, with this Kelvin wave uh, generates wave activity into the uh, PNA um, region. Um, I thought this result was uh, intriguing because everything that I discussed so far was uh, based on the source of uh, tropical heating, which was associated with uh, atmospheric convection. And um, uh, an earlier study um, showed that uh, if in a model you turn off the convection, then the uh, MJO will disintegrate in um, Kelvin, dry Kelvin waves and uh, Rossby waves. So convection, it is necessary for um, for maintaining the coupling between um, these two waves and uh, to uh, maintain the 30-day uh, oscillations that um, they were uh, investigating in, in that model, which um, translate into the um, DMJO. Of course, uh, once we start, when we started to uh, analyze the uh, GCMs, um, people started to wonder um, how large are the, uh, were, how well the GCMs are able to um, simulate these uh, observed teleconnections. Uh, and uh, the early uh, simulations suggested that GCMs tend to produce um, the observed relationships between the tropical convection and uh, mid-latitude circulation anomalies, especially during the boreal uh, winter. But they also show differences uh, from observations. Uh, and these differences uh, were attributed to the model's uh, inability to simulate the right uh, location of the tropical convection. Um, 
Another type of um, experiments, or more complex experiments designed to uh, understand the mechanisms um, driving the, um, the teleconnections were those, these so-called interve intervention experiments in which uh, in a very complex GCM you intervene uh, by um, nudging the tropical heating to um, some uh, observations uh, or some um, idealized uh, heating. And these experiments confirm um, the earlier um, results from observations that the extratropical response is sensitive to the phase speed of the forcing. Um, they also confirmed that the tropical convection outflow anomalies uh, lead to Rossby waves, which then interact with the mid-latitude flow in preferred locations. And where these interactions take place, um, they extract um, energy from the mean flow, and um, they allow the uh, uh, barotropic. Uh, they allow the growth of the um, barotropic mode. Um, other results show that the mid-latitude response to the MJO depends on the history of heating and cooling, and it's not just the, uh, the response of some uh, heating and cooling on a particular uh, longitude. And there is also some lag between the, the time of the forcing and, and the response. And another result, which um, uh, David used uh, in his presentation was that the short pulses of tropical heating also affect the mid-latitudes, and um, these effects can persist more than two weeks. Um, another interesting paper that um, definitely the experiments here were not designed to look at the um, the teleconnections, but the results are so relevant that I decided to uh, include this paper uh, in this review, are these experiments by Slingo and Slingo in which they look at the uh, impact of the uh, cloud rad radiating forcing um, on the, uh, the mid-latitude circulation. So they do uh, experiment in which they, uh, they cut off the uh, cloud radiating forcing. And um, they found that the uh, long wave cloud radiating forcing in the tropics accelerate the subtropical jets and generate uh, perturbation in the mid latitudes with the barotropic structure. And they also found that the long wave cloud forcing over South America induces a barotropic um, cyclonic circulation in the mid-latitudes and anticyclonic structures uh, in, in the northern hemisphere. So now I want to move uh, on and discuss the uh, influence of the mid-latitudes on, onto the tropics. And um, I will start again with, um, I like, uh, review uh, in time of uh, the evolution of, of this uh, subject. And uh, I think the motivation of this um, kind of uh, studies were um, based on the, the need to explain the energy source for the observed um, tropical waves that, uh, and also um, that were predicted at the same time by, by Matsuno. Um, there was also another um, interesting paper that was published a long time ago in 1965, which was trying to explain the formation of uh, hurricanes in the uh, eastern North Atlantic by the cold surges uh, from the uh, Antarctic uh, region. Uh, this is the only paper um, making this suggestion, and I don't think anyone else after that has has tried to, um, to look at this. So the idea was that the, uh, the cold air uh, from the uh, Antarctic uh, region will, once it, it propagates in certain conditions, it propagates uh, northward and will erode the static stability uh, in this region. And that uh, will 
uh, enhance the um, uh, easterly waves uh, activity that uh, will lead to the formation of uh, tropical cyclones in, in this region. So very early observational results suggested that only extratropical waves with the westward phase speed larger than the zonal mean flow can actually uh, propagate into the tropics. Um, and the strongest influence manifests over the uh, Pacific and uh, Atlantic Ocean. So these are the two um, regions where the um, activity of the uh, large-scale circulation in the mid-latitudes can uh, influence the, um, the tropical convective uh, activity. Um, we also uh, have learned that baroclinically uh, unstable disturbances of the mid-latitudes can modulate the tropical convection. And um, some of the results suggested that the mid-latitude storms maintain the uh, intra-seasonal variability of, uh, of the tropics. Uh, you have already seen this uh, figure uh, in David's presentation, uh, but um, the, um, the reason I am showing here is that there, um, there is a number of studies showing that the uh, mid-latitude circulation has an impact on the IPCZ, SPCZ, and South, uh, South Atlantic um, um, convergence zone. And this happens when the uh, extratropical uh, transient upper level troughs, which um, David showed us, doesn't work here, um, this, uh, can propagate uh, eastward. Um, and affect the, the cloud bands uh, in, into this region. And probably you have heard of this um, as referred to the so-called uh, PV streamers, potential vorticity um, streamers. Um, and uh, how this, um, this affect um, these regions, uh, it has been observed that during the boreal winter, uh, a Rossby wave train dominates the northern hemisphere, whereas the, uh, during the boreal summer, uh, the Rossby wave train uh, dominates um, in the southern hemisphere. Another uh, impact of the mid-latitude um, circulation on the, uh, the tropics uh, has been observed in association with the so-called uh, summer monsoon breaks. And um, there is an, we have a number of studies showing that the uh, mid-latitude circulations um, uh, uh, that have large troughs uh, penetrate into the, um, um, the westerlies over uh, India and they, cause, they can cause uh, breaks into the uh, monsoon, and these breaks um, have been have been observed to uh, have a, can last between any anyway between three to five days up to um, um, twenty days. Uh, the West African monsoon also experience, experiences some um, dry spells, uh, which are also associated with the mid latitude intrusion of cold and dry air from the. Uh, from over the Europe and the uh, Mediterranean uh, region. So uh, another a type of uh, event in which um, the um, tropical uh, weather is affected by uh, mid-latitude circulation are the so-called uh, cold air surges. And the cold air surges um, take place in many regions in okay. Sorry. Um, in the Asian Pacific region, South Pacific, South America, Central America, Caribbean, Africa, Indian Ocean, Maritime Continent, along the east coast of Australia, and also in, in North America. And uh, in North America, 
Um, for example, we experience um, freezing in uh, Florida, uh, which affects the um, orange uh, crops. So now uh, going into the uh, theoretical part, trying to uh, understand um, what are the mechanisms allowing this uh, to take place. Um, using a simple model, uh, people show that the propagation in the meridional direction uh, in the presence of the mean easterly flow is only possible only if the phase uh, velocity of the mid-latitude uh, wave um, is more easterly than uh, the mean flow. Then the large-scale um, disturbances generated in the northern uh, mid-latitudes may have a significant influence on uh, equatorial region uh, if a westerly duct uh, is present. And um, some of the studies suggest that the equatorial response of the extratropical forcing does not rely on the presence of this uh, westerly duct, but it's a direct projection of the forcing onto the uh, equatorial trapped waves. So one of the uh, big questions um, that um, remains um, in trying to understand the influence of the mean latitude into the tropics is what are the systematic aspects and mechanisms of the extratropical initiation and maintenance of the organized tropical um, convection. So uh, moving on, because I think I'm getting close to <laughs> the end of my time, um, I want to um, go very quickly over the two-way interactions and, and feedbacks uh, between the two regions that uh, David also mentioned. And um, the, the current understanding is that, for example, Rossby waves excited by the MJO uh, will propagate into the subtropics, will break here, and um, when they break, they, um, they can influence the um, convective activity uh, in the tropics, and then the cycle um, repeats. Um, and the monsoon breaks is also uh, an example of um, of the uh, um, two-way interaction between the mid latitudes and uh, and the tropics because the changes in the um, convection induced by the mid latitude circulation then will affect the um, teleconnections of the boreal summer intraseasonal uh, oscillations. So. A main question that remains uh, is to what extent are these dominant uh, tropical and extratropical uh, interseasonal oscillation uh, connected? And David tried to um, address um, a little bit of that, and <laughs> uh, and then more discussion was um, um, initiated by uh, by the audience. So. Um, of course, um, it's uh, the ultimate goal of uh, understanding um, the mechanisms and these teleconnections is to uh, use this knowledge for uh, improving the forecast um, range and the uh, subseasonal to seasonal variability seems to be uh, a time scale that can um, largely benefit from, the, from these um, teleconnections. And for example, a number of studies have shown that the extended range of the mid-latitude uh, large-scale circulation with small uh, errors in the tropical simulation of tropical heating, it is actually, uh, they are actually um, skillful. So this um, figure taken by a paper by Frederic Vitar is showing the NAO index for day um, 1925 uh, the uh, solid line corresponds to uh, cases when the MJO is present in the initial conditions, and the dashed line corresponds to cases when MJO is not present in the initial uh, conditions. So uh, if we looked uh, uh, after year 2006 here, we see that the, uh, MJ the cases with the MJO 
show a larger um, correlation, which translates into a better forecast skill than the cases with no uh, MJO in the initial condition. So now you may say, but what about what happened before? Well, before, the model uh, had, did a very poor job in simulating the MJO. So actually, when the MJO was supposed to be uh, present in the initial condition because of the large errors uh, in the location uh, of the tropical heating, um, the model had very low um, scale. So I will uh, wrap up with uh, listening some of the uh, remaining challenges um, that um, the uh, YTMIT project uh, is trying to address and also the uh, subseasonal to seasonal project is, uh, is working on to. So for example, uh, can we understand the mid-latitude teleconnections from the fluctuating tropical heating as a time lag stationary wave response to the heating, or does the time dependent wave interface play a role in, uh, in the response? Um, so how do intense mid latitude storms and polar propagating tropical storm interact with the polar vortex? and alter the uh, annual modes on subseasonal time scale. So this is a little bit of an extension of the uh, teleconnections into the uh, much higher uh, latitudes. Uh, to what extent are the dominant tropical and extra uh, extratropical intraseasonal oscillation uh, connected? Um, what aspects of the intraseasonal heating arising from tropical convection are most important for forcing the extratropical responses. So we, we heard of uh, various results where um, um, various studies have looked at uh, different aspects and found different aspects uh, being important, but we don't actually know the relative importance of all of these factors. Um, other Questions that uh, remind what is the sensitivity to vertical and horizontal structure and to temporal evolution of, of the heating and why? Um, does tropical forcing amplify the intrinsic intraseasonal variability or excite new perturbations? So I think this has not, um, well, uh, has not been uh, established. And for example, most of the um, studies, um, for example, look, looking at the influence of the MJO on various um, weather events, um, they show uh, an actual modulation of that events, but none of the studies are actually showing ex uh, a triggering of that uh, particular event. Um, something that um, we would like to understand it, what explains the hemispheric uh, asymmetry of the responses to tropical forcing. It's only the um, land-sea um, distribution, or there are other uh, factors that contribute to this uh, asymmetry. And uh, one very important as, uh, aspect uh, is the role of the basic state errors in the simulation of these um, teleconnections. And I think... This is my last slide, yes. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions.